Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we are bringing a guest much classier than ourselves to talk about a fantastic episode of The Simpsons. But first, of course, joining me as always, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? Well, now that we're past the episode from last week, I think I can say I'm fine and dandy like sour candy, Miles. <clears throat> All right, Mr. President. <laughs> whoa, whoa, let's not get carried away. Although, as we frequently say, any choice could probably be better than what we're under right now. But we're not here to talk politics. We're here to talk Simpsons. Let me throw it back to you. The man, the myth, the magnet box. He is Miles. Today, uh, we are talking about scenes from the class struggle in Springfield, which was specifically picked by our guest today, David Allison, who I met at the Dallas Comedy House, another great person that's come into my life through that place. Uh, David is a hilarious improviser, and he also does stand-up and sketch comedy. Really funny dude, and most importantly, the reason he's here today, fan of The Simpsons. How you doing today, David? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Miles and Richie. Can't wait to do this. Talk The Simpsons. I, we are so excited to have you on the show. I, again, I met you at Dallas Comedy House. We bonded over, I believe, my Simpsons t-shirts is how we initially started chatting with one another and instantly made that connection. And frankly, you've been one of the most uh, the people I've been most excited to have on the show. So we're so glad to have you here today. Well, that's so nice to hear. I hope everyone else in the theater hears that. <laughs> That way they can understand I was the desirable one for, like, the first time in my life. It's perfect. That's definitely <laughs> not true, sir. <laughs> uh, but that's, I'm so excited because um, my wife and I watch The Simpsons constantly. Uh, it's, you know, how everybody has those shows that not only they grew up with, but they continue to watch reruns of, like, a couple a night <laughs> to <laughs> just, like, rest and wind down from the day. Uh, and even though the show is uh, very old, and I've seen so many of the episodes a million times, I still continue to watch The Simpsons on a weekly, if not daily basis. Love the show. That's awesome, man. That's honestly more than I'm able to get in most of the time at this point. But uh, when You did... watch it weekly, at least. I watch it weekly, at least. I, I rarely get to keep up with it <laughs> daily at this point. Though there was a time in, in my life where uh, WB33 was, you know, packing in the reruns, as we talked about. But, uh, David, what are, uh, we always ask, what's your kind of connection to the show? Obviously, you just shared with us that it's still a big part of your life, but when did you start watching? I started watching um, pretty early on in the run of the show. I want to say season two or three. Um, and I watched it weekly, uh, every single Sunday night. I was there. And then as reruns started happening consistently in the afternoon, I'm from Arizona, and so every day between four and five, you'd have two different Simpsons episodes, and they just kept cycling through the seven seasons, and then the eight seasons, and then as the show grew, I would just watch those over and over and over again. So right in the middle of the golden age is where you got the most repetition. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Or the I, we it's, always say the quote golden age because we try to keep we're we're wanting to keep an open mind through every episode until we review it because frankly we're kind of of the mindset that The Simpsons is just a solid show in general. A lot of people like to say, "Oh, it was a great show back in the day," but I have yet to see what I would call a bad episode. Yeah, I've seen some episodes that I enjoy less than other episodes. Absolutely. But I agree, especially when hold it in the context of like television today. It holds up pretty well. Like I've watched most of this season. I enjoy it. I still get a couple of laughs. Like it's a fun show consistently. And to do that over that period of time is insane. <laughs> True. They just got renewed for two more seasons this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so 32 years minimum of The Simpsons. There's There's going to be probably like a a 7.4 in there somewhere on the IMDb rating, and that's okay. You made it sound more like a sentence than like an enjoyable thing, but that's, I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> like, you will be forced to go through 32 years of this. Well, honestly, <laughs> Hopefully one of those is, episodes is us. <laughs> yeah, and it is kind of like a sentence for me as a fan, because I'm going to watch it pretty much no matter what. Uh, like, yeah. I don't think I've ever missed an episode. I'm going to keep going until there's none left. I can so, really feel that, it is a, yeah. a sentence of sorts, but it's uh yeah, it could be worse. We'll definitely say that. 
For sure. <laughs> You know, something sure. that's, uh, that's kind of new to Richie and I through this experience, uh, we both started watching it when uh, we were kids, is what, like before, probably before we were old enough to really understand it truly, and it just kind of was always there. Uh, but we never really took too much notice to who was really behind the scenes of the show, and especially in terms of showrunners. And going through now, we see how much of an influence, the little subtle tone shifts and things that are unique to each showrunner. That's one of the things that stuck out about you to me when we first started talking with Simpsons is your very first question, I believe, that you asked me was, have you done the Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein seasons yet? Uh, and that, of course, is where we currently are. And what we're finding about these guys is, first of all, they were writing partners from a very young age. It was either like age seven or say age nine, and they were just always friends. And I think that there is a chemistry, a magic to their writing style, where it's the two of them almost uh, almost become one as they create these great shows. But they're also super fans themselves of the seasons that came before them. And we see so much influence and in, uh, allusions and, and kind of just homages to the previous seasons what is it to you that got you so excited about these two guys as the showrunner? I adore these two seasons. Season seven and eight are just, to me, the golden age. I know that uh, we've used that term already in a couple of different contexts, but those two seasons are just, like, perfect. Like, there's not a bad episode, I would say. Like, not even... Not even a bad episode, because it's tough to say that any of them are quote-unquote bad for, like, the entire run of The Simpsons. But, like, every episode in these two seasons is great. They're so consistent, so dense, and the couple of things that really stick out to me when I think of those two seasons are how strong the characterization is, like, of the family. Like, we get to see the family and those, like, main characters in different roles, which is one of my favorite things about this episode in particular. You get to see different facets of them. It's not just like Homer is playing the exact same character that he did in the early seasons, that we get to see a different side of him. We get to see a different side of Marge, of Lisa. And that's, to me, a pretty consistent theme throughout this entire run of 7 and 8. Like, if you look at um, uh, Summer of Four Foot Two mm, at the very end of the episode. season, yeah, yeah it's, it's beautiful. And I know we shouldn't talk about it too much because you haven't covered that yet. Yeah, but to see a completely different side of Lisa is amazing. Uh, and that's what I love about this episode in particular. We get to see so much more about Marge. Um, so that's the first thing. And then also, there's still just such density to the joke writing. Uh, it's so specific and so, like, rapid fire, where every line or every other line has a laugh. And it's incredible. That's awesome, man. Uh, you're First of all, Very you're well jumping put. ahead on my questions, because I was going to ask next why you, you chose this, uh, but that that's fine, totally cool. But uh, it's so interesting <laughs> that you, you say that, because Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein talk uh, consistently on the DVD commentary about their desire to really put a new lens on not only the Simpsons family dynamic, but also the surrounding townspeople, the side characters, and kind of building the um, the world building i guess of springfield but specifically with the simpsons themselves they do like to kind of take a deeper look at specific characters that don't always get the spotlight like lisa and marge in this episode uh and it's just uh, i i am gonna go ahead and jump out on a limb and say you've probably listened to some of the commentaries otherwise you are just very very in tune with these two's uh these two's mind I have for sure listened to all the commentaries for all of these episodes. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but it's still, I, I think that you can definitely pick up on that. And uh, there's a lot of really fun, unique things about this episode. And that's actually been one thing, too. There is so much trivia packed into each and every one of these episodes. It's getting more and more difficult to keep these podcasts contained into any sort of reasonable time. Uh, just because of how <laughs> how much these two pack into every single episode. Their callbacks to previous seasons even are amazing. Last week, we talked a lot about the garage sale on, Ever uh, on Evergreen Terrace uh, during Two Bad Neighbors. And basically, that was like that whole scene was just a love letter to some of the zany adventures that The Simpsons have already been on through the art of a garage sale. Well, and what you got to like about the guys, too, is that they're just not... It's not just that they're super fans, but you actually feel like they understand and care for the characters too, which uh, 
like like you said, David, it, it makes it it makes you feel even more for him when you see the other sides of him. So I, I've like I honestly did not think I could like shows more than I did with David Merkin just because of the, <laughs> the dark twists and turns. He had a very specific feel for his episodes, but these two guys are so much fun to to watch their episodes, especially as Miles alluded to earlier, being older and recognizing subtle differences in the show. It's I, I've been blown away by season seven so far. And are you all familiar with their work outside of The Simpsons? Like, did you have you guys seen Mission Hill? No, I'm actually very unfamiliar with their work outside of The Simpsons. So they did a cartoon, uh, cartoon, an animated series. I think it aired on UPN at first. Um, pretty closely after they wrapped working with the Simpsons. Uh, and it only lasted for about a, no, under a season. Uh, but they, like, you can see so much of their writing style in this show. And if you haven't seen it before, I'd highly recommend checking it out. Like, I grew up in that exact time period that it was released. I was in, like, the exact demographic. I had never heard of it before. Uh, and then my wife had the DVD set, and we watched it and have seen it a million times now. Uh, it's a fantastic show. Like Brian Pesane was one of the voices on it. Oh, I love Brian um, it, Yeah, it, it follows um, like this group of a small amount of friends in New York, and the lead like works at a marketing agency. The animation style is like really unique uh, and very very colorful. Like even more colorful than The Simpsons. It's a lot of like blues and pinks and and stuff like that. Uh, and it only lasted like maybe 10 to 12 episodes, uh, but they used to air it a lot on Adult Swim. And if you have not seen it, it's a great example of their work. I remember seeing the ads for it on Adult yeah. Swim, but I, didn't, I don't actually ever remember catching the show. So I'll have to check that out. I'm only familiar with Bill Oakley's more recent work with like the Steamy Awards and, and fast food updates on Twitter. I will say I follow oh. <laughs> Bill Oakley on Twitter and he's fantastic if you don't already. He, uh, his reviews of fast food are, are worth it alone. <laughs> yeah, he did an episode of a podcast I love called The Doughboys, yeah, um, yeah. which was great if you love Bill Oakley, <laughs> which I'm assuming you guys do. Uh, yes, definitely. And Josh Weinstein, for what it's worth, too, he tweets out a lot of like very old kind of behind the scenes stuff that has never been seen in terms of like, he'll have random shit in his closet of like a script. He's like, Oh yeah, here's a random thing I wrote for the Simpsons. episode, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it never made it to air, but uh, here it is. If you want to read it. So he, there's some really cool stuff coming from both of those guys online. That was my favorite thing about when they did the marathon of the Simpsons on FX. What yeah. probably like three to five years ago now. Um, was all of the former writers and creative team behind the show, just like sharing all their stories and photos and everything behind the scenes. It was like you had had the commentary track to that point for a while, but to get like their personal stories and the stuff that, you know, Matt Groening and, and company isn't going to talk about um, was really, really the best part of that marathon. It's really fun once you get to a point where you know all these episodes so well, you can kind of uh, just hearing someone talk about specific scenes, you can almost see it in your mind. And when you hear their process, uh, the creators of the show specifically, it, it's fascinating. And uh, I, yeah, I agree. Those are those are my favorite things, too. It's one of my favorite things about this show is uh, diving real deep on the re arguably too deep on the research at times. <laughs> Because uh, I, I often have way too many tabs open on my computer as I go through these rabbit holes. But they are it's a lot of fun just to kind of see where these jokes originated. Yeah, and as a listener of the show, I appreciate the hard work. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So we are talking about the episode Scenes from the Class Struggle in Springfield Today, which originally aired on February 4th, 1996. This one ran very long, actually, which we're going to talk about later. And for that reason, there was no chalk gag. And the couch gag on this one, I actually really liked. It was short and sweet, but when they ran in, it was like almost like blacklight vision. And there was like a distorted guitar type of thing happening. Uh, but as soon as Homer turns on the lamp, everything goes back to normal and we can start the show. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one, too. I believe it's a new one. That's a reference to Hill Street Blues, I think. Like it's it's a reference to one of those uh, like sitcom -y shows in the eighties. Oh, fantastic! I didn't know that, that theme song. It's very fitting. It works. Uh, the commentary track on this one for the DVD was Bill Oakley, Josh Weinstein, the directors Susie Dieter, and Matt Groening. And there's a whole lot of cool new stuff happening in this one. 
It's uh, the first episode of Disc 3 on the box set, so new disc day. And even more cool, I think, this is the first episode of The Simpsons ever to be written and directed by female artists, essentially, or uh, producers of the show, creators of the show. Susie Dieter, I already pointed out, was the director, and Jennifer Crittenden was the writer of this episode, making it the first woman-woman team. Awesome. I, I know we we talked about certain people being attached to Marge stories in the past and whatnot, and... Um... It's good to have that perspective on this episode in particular, for sure. For sure. Absolutely, and I, we talk about it a lot, but Susie Dieter always stands out in my mind anytime we talk about an episode she directs, uh, specifically because of the episode Bart Gets Famous, where uh, they visit the box factory. If you recall, we talked about... Uh, they basically kept coming back at her saying like, no, this is too boring. This is too boring. And she just kept standing <laughs> her ground being like, that's the joke, idiot. Like it is boring. Like that's <laughs> what it's supposed to be. Uh, and it stayed exactly the way she wanted it to. And I just love, uh, love when people who have a creative vision stand their ground and, and fight against the power, so to speak. Well, and she was absolutely right too. I mean, that's what made that whole scene. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, we open up this episode like so many others on a The Simpsons watching television. In this case, it's Bumblebee Man on the television. Uh, I think he hurts his tooth on a thing of corn, if I remember right. Is that, that how it went? Yeah, that's, and you know, Miles, I hate you so much because ever since you brought this up multiple episodes ago, I feel like every single episode starts with them watching TV now, and I aye, can't aye, get aye. that out of my out of my mind ever. <laughs> I, n- I can't believe I never noticed how often they're doing that before, but, ah, uh, Miles! It makes so much sense, though, because it's an easy yeah. way for them to either add or trim uh, according to what they need to, and like I said, this episode runs long, so this is a very brief bit of Bumblebee. Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> uh, he does- wants the corn so bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't take long for Abe to do what Abe does best. Grandpa comes in the room and ruins everything by trying to adjust the television. Uh, he's ends up basically tackling the thing and destroying it. So the Simpsons very quickly take him back to the retirement center where they're quickly relieved <laughs> and actually kind of excited about the idea of getting a new TV. Let's go to the Sharp Remage. They've got a TV shaped like a 50s diner. <laughs> <laughs> the Nature Company has one that's created by the Hopi Indians. Marge line's great here, though, because they she points out they can't afford to shop anywhere that has a philosophy. <laughs> Uh, one of my one of my favorite things about uh, this podcast is how you all um, highlight certain lines. So as I was rewatching the episode a couple of days ago, I did write down a couple of predictions for which lines you two would highlight. Oh, and wow. so far, I'm so far I'm one for one. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> the man. listing of TVs uh, I, I thought would get some reaction, and yay, I'm one for one. I know the show. <laughs> That's fun. That's that's pretty. Does funny. that mean we're too predictable, Miles? Yeah. We uh, <laughs> we're gonna all. go the opposite with next week's episode, and we're gonna specifically pick all the lines that we would never read and skip the <laughs> ones that we normally would, just to well, keep everyone have... on their toes. Yeah, you'll have a less weird guest le- next week, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, uh, I'm gonna tell. I'm already gonna sidebar. This might be our first three parter. It's fine. Uh, no, uh, I had a conversation one night with another another great guy from uh, Dallas Comedy House, uh, Kyle Austin, and he he straight up said when I told him you were going to be on the show, he was just like he like stopped our conversation dead and was like he is going to be the best guest ever, like he's going to be perfect for this podcast. So uh, <laughs> bars high is what I'm trying to say. Well, yeah, I'm <laughs> much more likable than Mike Reese. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right? what did that guy ever do, honestly? <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I'm way more famous than him. That's fair. That's totally fair. <laughs> Either way, now the Simpsons are off to the only place they can afford a television, and that is the Ogdenville Outlet Mall, which Ogdenville you may recognize as one of the towns that was swindled by Lyle Landley in the Marge vs. the Monorail episode. Uh, I think it's funny how far they drive to visit this outlet mall uh, if you add all of these Save money. these together. But I guess it was a different time in the 90s. Gas wasn't quite as high as it is now. And apparently there is a former Japanese internment camp around there. 
So that's actually a joke that Josh Weinstein talks about on the commentary because that in, is true to uh, California. If you drive out to the outlet mall that's nearest, I guess, Los Angeles, uh, you actually have to drive by a former uh, Japanese internment camp. Wow. Just a dark little blip in our American history. Yeah, we've got a couple of those. <laughs> not to uh, shit on America, but our education system is awful. I did not even know that that was a thing until my junior year of high school. Like, I, I like it was completely oblivious to me, and I didn't know it till we read a book. And I was like, "Wait, what are they talking about?" I was so ignorant. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, but hey, public school, man. What can I say? <laughs> I was and I was like a pretty decent student at that time too, so it wasn't like they were teaching it and I wasn't absorbing it. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely uh, something that gets skipped over a lot. Like I feel like when I was going through uh, the education system and they were talking about history, they would spend a lot of time talking about everything leading up to like World War One. Yeah, and then everything else was just crammed in like after spring break, and nobody was paying attention. And then the soldiers uh, got so, back from World War Two, and everything was happy again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the world was fixed. People rights all around. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's um, there's it's very funny what they choose to to teach, not teach. I mean, I, I get it, but at the same time, let's learn from our mistakes. Maybe I don't know. Let's talk about cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> we get to the. Uh, the mall, the uh, outlet mall is what I'm trying to say, and we see a lot of knockoff brands that are really fun, and the writers say that those are the types of jokes that they just absolutely love, and at the time of the recording of the commentary, they all still said they cannot walk into an electronic store without seeing everything saying things like Sorny and Magnaphonics or Panaphonics or whatever. Panaphonics, like yeah, and I love Magnifox. that box. <laughs> And whoa, Miles, those are all famous brand name electronics. Okay? <laughs> That's true. Uh, and honestly, though, they're all garbage compared to the <laughs> Cadillac of televisions, the Carnival. I mean, it's got a two pronged wall plug, a pre molded hand grip well, durable outer casing to prevent fall apart. Sold. You wrap it up, I'll start bringing in the pennies. <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, oh. we cut immediately to Marge and Lisa, who are also having a good time trying to find a bargain, though they're at a clothing store. Uh, I think that Marge is kind of realizing, though, that maybe this isn't the place that they would shop. And just then, uh, as Lisa's wondering who would be those type of people, we get the return of Cletus. And I don't think we've seen Brandine, or if we have, it's been very, very brief, but she actually gets some lines in this one. Uh, specifically, when Cletus recommends that she gets a classy lassie shirt to wear to work. Oh, Cletus, you know I gotta wear the shirt what Dairy Queen gave me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate just uh, Cletus and Brandine throughout this entire episode, and uh, the fact that they seemingly live at the outlet mall. Those bargains are great, man. From that, what was that? The bra bin called <laughs> the bra, the bra barrel. barrel. <laughs> 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 they, no size differential at all. Just a barrel of bras so that you can you can go digging through. Uh, but you know what's cool about a thrift store is honestly most of it's junk. But every now and again, you find yourself a treasure, and lo and behold, that's exactly what happens when Lisa goes climbing inside the racks. She comes out with a Chanel suit that is in perfect condition and happens to be in Marge's size, and it just seems like it's meant to be, though Marge is absolutely against it because she just couldn't really see herself buying something just for her. I mean, maybe if the whole family could wear the suit. <laughs> Come on, she never treats herself to anything, though. I do, too. I treated myself to a Senka not three days ago. <laughs> And I like how it's Lisa is the one enticing her to buy it in this scene and not Bart or Homer. Like, I enjoyed this little moment where it's something Lisa doesn't typically do, but at the same time, like, she's talking common sense into her. Let's have some fun. Yeah, there's so much fun Lisa stuff in this episode. And I know it's not, like, a Lisa-centric one, but you get to see her, like, real love and affection for her mom and like, this scene and later on. You get to see her being more of a kid than she normally is with her affinity yes. for the horses. Like, it's so cool to see, like, those different facets to Lisa being more than just like, ah, she's the smart one. 
Okay. One of our favorite things that we often talk about that's reoccurring on The Simpsons is Lisa is the smart one, as you just said, but at the end of the day, she's always still written as an eight-year-old girl. So she might be hyper-intelligent. She might be a little bit too, uh, like, even more emotionally heightened and connected than you might expect an eight-year-old to be. But when a pony or candy or, like, a dolly or whatever, she she always resorts back to what she is, and that's an eight-year-old, which is really fun uh for her to kind of have that character trait and her boy craziness Abs- yeah Cor- she the loves boys. hotline yeah totally she has her weaknesses yeah. <laughs> definitely i want a lollipop you know there's a couple things to say about the chanel suit actually uh first of all it was modeled after an actual chanel suit and they wanted to go for a style of something that uh jacqueline kennedy would have worn was the kind of the idea that they had in mind totally makes yeah. sense uh, however, Matt Groening was extremely nervous about this idea. He really didn't think it was going to work. He thought that his characters were too simple. And like when he drew them, he specifically had their clothing very simplistic because that was kind of the, the idea of his drawings. And he just didn't think it was going to going to happen. But he ended up being very happy with the way it turned out, as did everyone, because Marge actually looked really good in a Chanel dress essentially like it was a great character model yeah it was but that's <laughs> i enjoy the actual like right before the transaction of her buying it where lisa's telling her you don't have to rationalize everything just buy it and she literally rationalizes <laughs> buying it on the next yeah. line so it'll be good for the economy <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another quick thing on the dress, uh, they obviously called it a Chanel dress, but they n- were not allowed to actually show the word Chanel. Very similar to the Ayatollah Asahola that we had last week. They always had to find a creative way to cover up at least one letter so that it never said Chanel on screen. Oh, and see, it's kind of like a mind trick because you see the tag a little. And you're like, okay, that is Chanel, but it's like... Her thumb or something was covering up the C, I believe. I thought it was weird, though, just that enough they could to say Chanel and not show Chanel. Like, that seems like a weird place to draw the line in the sand as a company. Well, if you're showing the brand, like, on the screen, that could be some kind of copyright issue, I'm assuming. Yeah, and couldn't you also technically say, like, oh, we're saying Chanel, spelled S-H-A-N-E-L. Oh, or whatever. yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's uh, a really good point. Like how Mr. Yeah. Burns says, schedule. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It gives you, like, a little bit of doubt, whereas if you show it, it eliminates that doubt. Yeah, that's that's a good good point, uh, but that I, I just think it's funny that they're able to get away with just putting a thumb over one letter, and they're like, oh, yep, that's good enough. Yep. <laughs> if there's one staff that knows how to get through loopholes, it's the Simpsons staff. There you go. So Marge decides to go ahead and treat herself, and she deserves it. She is a... Mm. Uh, a wonderful woman who never treats herself to anything and it's fun to see marge have this little bit of joy in her life though it's almost immediately extinguished by homer because when she suggests they go and catch something like an orchestra or a symphony or you know something of that nature spurlock's cafeteria it is what's the point of going out we're just gonna wind up back here anyway (laughs) so true homer i mean homer's got a point you can't argue that yeah, it's 100% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, there is a really fun shot we go to where it seems like maybe that Homer might have caved in and they did actually go to an opera. Uh, then we pan out and see that it's just on TV. And in fact, they even have a great thing where the TV kind of flickers with a uh, static as we see Marge is just vacuuming in her Chanel suit. Uh, the good old days of vacuuming ruining your TV viewing experience. Yeah, you would think a carnival would be better than that. Right? <laughs> Man. Marge is basically just wearing this suit everywhere. She, You can tell she's really fond of it. It makes her feel good, and, you know, why not? So even when she has to just do basic things like run errands, head over to the Quickie Mart, she still wears it. Uh, and in this case, she's uh, greeted by a poo who admits she looks very prosperous today and offers to uh, buy her, or offers to sell her some impulse items next to the register. You know, like a motorized wiggle pin. <laughs> Look at the craziness. <laughs> we see a, what I would say is a well-to-do woman come up and ask the attendant for some gas, but Apu very quickly recognizes that this is not the type of customer that he wants to engage in, so he pretends he doesn't speak English. 
he does a pretty convincing job, and even the woman calls him out for call it just talking to Marge. He's just like, yeah, yeah, hot dog, yes sir, no sir, maybe, okay. Uh, so Evelyn decides she's in, or uh, she's Evelyn in the script. This well-to-do woman decides she's going to call Triple A to help her with her gas. Marge quickly points out that she can help her. I mean, she used to be a little overwhelmed herself, but it's not that hard. And this is when Evelyn, the woman at the uh, gas station, recognizes Marge Bouvier from high school and is actually surprised to see that Marge is looking wonderful. And all these years, she thought that she had married Homer Simpson. Yeah, she has one of my favorite lines in the episode here where she said, you come, you've come so far from the woman I knew nothing about <laughs> back in high school. Um, yeah. Hi, Evelyn. <laughs> we cut to outside where I'll note that this is only the second time that the Quickie Mart has ever been shown with gas pumps. The last time we saw them was Sweet Seymour Skinner's Badass Song. And it was when the Quickie Mart exploded. So hopefully this isn't foretelling to something terrible that might happen. Yeah, the um, I remember on one of the commentary tracks, they pointed out, I think it was commentary, they pointed out like, yeah, if you notice something weird in the frame, like, oh, I didn't think the Quickie Mart had a gas uh, pump set up, then it's probably going to be a major set piece in a moment. Oh, yeah. uh, same if you see a Simpsons character wearing an unusual article of clothing. Like, a great example is when yeah. Bart stills Bone Storm. He's wearing a jacket that we've never seen him wear before, but suddenly he has it for plot points. It makes sense. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it makes total sense. Or if, like, if they're looking at a fence and a couple of the panels are slightly discolored. Yeah. It's like, oh, I know that those panels are about to flip sure. up right that now. That was even way bad if you go back to, like, cartoons like Scooby-Doo, where you'd have, like, that re-rolling backdrop, and then, like, one door yep. that was animated well. You're like, oh, I wonder where the monster's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, Evelyn is actually impressed that Marge seemingly has both automotive skills, being able to pump gas, and fashion sense. Uh, so... She invites Marge to come out to the country club and, you know, come for a visit, even bring the family. And you can see that Marge is elated by this. She is very much uh, a fan of seeing herself in that lifestyle. However, not everybody views her in that light because Byrne comes up in a what has to be a like <laughs> 1920s vehicle and quickly honks yelling out, You there, fill up with petroleum, distillate, and revulcanize my tires post haste. I want to drive this they, car, by the way. That thing looks like a lot of fun. I know they cut away shortly afterwards. Um, actually, I think pretty much immediately afterwards. Uh, but I like to think that Marge helped Burns, too. You, it seems like that's the type of thing she would do, honestly. I mean, yeah, she is just like, that's just kind of her spirit, is just to do nice things for people. Uh, hopefully Burns tipped, but let's be real. No. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> You know, would have given, but, yeah. No, no, you're the guy. I was going to say you would have given like some very specific penny. Yes, yeah, it would have, yeah, like a, <laughs> yeah, a buffalo penny or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, something very, very old. My thing with Burns in this episode is thinking about how just 14 episodes ago, him and Homer were at odds because they everybody thought that he had shot Burns, and like how everything's already blown over and everything's back to normal, and for some reason I couldn't really get past that this time around. Like He actually remembers Homer's name multiple times in this episode, so I guess something stuck with him. Burns seems to have a different attitude to Homer as he's a club member. I, I noted later in the script, we can talk about that as we get to kind of the golf sequence. But it's interesting that it's almost like Burns, uh, you know, I mean, Burns is very much a classist person. So seeing Homer just being in the club's grounds automatically puts him like a peg higher than he normally would be, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Marge is already... Very nervous, it would seem, about taking her family to this prestigious club because she's trying to coach them on getting ready. She's telling Bart to comb his hair. And more importantly, she doesn't think Homer should wear a short sleeve shirt with a tie. But Sipowicz does. If Detective Sipowicz jumped off a cliff, would you do that too? Oh, uh, I wish I was Sipowicz. So, the Sipowicz is a... a 
reference to NYPD Blue, where the uh, actor Dennis Franz plays the character Sipowitz. He's usually seen in a short team, a short sleeve button-up shirt and a tie. And it's notable that Dennis Franz actually was a previous guest star on The Simpsons and Homer Badman. <laughs> he actually played Homer in Homer yeah. S. Portrait of an Ass Grabber. It's funny how they tied that back around. Yeah. The weird, the weird thing about that reference is it's a much more modern reference than they normally make. It is. It's like something that's currently on the air almost, or it yeah. is at the time that they made this. They, there's another contemporary reference earlier when uh, Lisa says that Marge looks like Mary Hart, which yeah. I think is just talking about the Entertainment Tonight host, Mary Hart. That's also what I gathered from that reference, because I couldn't find anything else about Mary Hart. Yeah, and it's like, that's an interesting thing, because normally their references are like 200-year-old historical events that nobody's heard of, like... Burns talking about vulcanizing tires and <laughs> yeah. uh, that specific sort of petroleum. So to hear uh, the Sipowitz line, to hear the Mary Hart thing, I'm sure there are other ones in this episode. It's just unique. It makes me wonder if it is due to the fact that uh, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein are significantly younger than the other showrunners that were before them. I mean, by, by several years. So uh, it might just be that they kind of have a good tie-in of pop culture, like current and historical references, or could be something entirely different, but that's a very interesting observation. Well, and they had a good eye for things that would be, like, memorable in the future, in a way. Yeah. I mean, Detective Sipowitz, like, that reference kind of sticks around. Like, most people have at least heard of NYPD Blue. Uh, Mary Hart still kind of does things. So it's not like they referenced something that was going on in 97 that, like, no one would understand in the future. Yeah. They, so they, they it's interesting that they took that risk. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because everything else, you're right, they, they usually go with things that are pretty solidified. But to be fair, sometimes they pick really obscure things anyway, so they might not mind if it ends up not being that memorable. For or sure. they needed somebody in a short sleeve shirt with a tie. Yeah, also true. <laughs> uh, the family is protesting. They all want to not go for their various reasons. Uh, for instance, Lisa thinks the country club is a hotbed of exclusionist snobs and status-seeking social climbers. I've told you, I don't like you using the word hotbed. <laughs> please, Lisa, we so rarely get to do things like this. And everybody, everybody, please... Be on your best behavior. I love that we Bart, see Bart, no uh, he has like a deck of cards coming out of his sleeves as Marge yells at him, no grifting. He's good at that too. It's all raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> what an unusual thing for him to say too, but it's like perfect for like the grifter look. I don't know. Raspberries. He's, he's this, the character I wanted to see more about in this episode because you see everyone else finding their little corner in the country club, but you never see Bart finding his corner in the country club. So I'm wondering if he is grifting the entire time. <laughs> I'm actually kind of fine with it because I am under the controversial opinion that Bart is the weakest of the main characters. Oh, wow. So if we're going to focus on the others. Cool with me. So Bart was like my childhood hero uh, back when I was younger. But I mean, you know, he kind of was... A boy, I mean, that was very common in Bart Mania in, in the 90s, so that's by no means uh, an unusual opinion. But I very rarely hear somebody say that Bart is the like least interesting of the family members. Well, I just think that it, it comes to be illuminated later on in the episode, and I can talk about it then when Marge has her little uh, conclusion oh, with each line, of the characters. I, that line yeah. is one of my favorite lines in every uh, or in this episode too. That's so funny. So and it, and it does kind of prove your point to an extent, but that's it. that's just interesting. I've just never heard that opinion. But moving on with this for now, we see the Simpsons that's called a team. <laughs> uh, we see that the <laughs> Simpsons family is driving up to the country club and when they're asked by the gatekeeper uh, their name Marge decides it's uh, vital to point out that they're not poor. <laughs> <laughs> they look around nervously some more and it's like, well, we're not. <laughs> but it's fine because the gatekeeper says they're expecting them. Go on in and they immediately are surrounded by some very posh settings, including a golf course that Homer accidentally drives through. And we see the first of several incidences where Krusty is going to be near assaulted or in some cases, just flat out assaulted as he dives out of the way of Homer's car coming over the green. And that is actually going to bring us to the end of our first act. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back for act two 
of scenes from the class struggle in Springfield. Hey guys, I'm here to talk about a serious problem today. One that can affect us all, but it's also a problem that can be fixed with everyone's help. I'm Richie the Whiz Kid, and I'm talking about podcasts. So many podcasts in the Somebody's Network need your help. They are being malnourished. Some are living in terribly harsh conditions, and some are Canadian. But with your help, a corner can be turned for these poor podcasts, especially in regards to Best Darn Diddly. You can go to popthreads.com and use the code SIMPSONS at checkout. Or you can buy Best Darn Diddly merch at tpublic.com. Most importantly, you can go to patreon.com slash bestdarndiddly to donate now for as little as $1 a month. For less than four cents a day, you can bring a smile to these poor podcasters' faces. So let's work together to end the poverty of these podcasts. Let's be honest, you were probably just going to get a Krusty Burger with that dollar anyways. Cut to the pictures of starving podcasts. Back from the break, we see Marge is meeting the other women at the club as Evelyn is introducing her to Corinne, Jillian, Eliza Beth, Patricia, Roberta, Suzanne. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a joke that Josh Weinstein wanted to like stop the commentary to talk about because he's so proud of it. He loves this joke and he's frustrated that he feels like either people... One, either just don't really get it, or two, just don't think it's as funny as he does. <laughs> <laughs> but just how they overpronunciate each and every one of these very, very simple names. Marge is very pleasant in this moment, and she says she's pleased to meet you. You look like a, such a happy bunch of people. That's the trouble with first impressions. You only get to make one. Ooh, Suzanne is very catty right out the bat. And uh, Susan's character is actually based on the woman Dorothy Parker, who is a poet, writer, and critic known... uh, She lived from 1893 to 1967, and she was known for her wit and her wisecrack. So she was a very funny woman uh, that actually inspired this character. Uh, Not to do with the real-life Dorothy Parker, but just a running gag they decided to do with this character as well, is in each and every shot, not seen... But literally shot, uh, Susan has a different type of drink glass in her hand. So, like, when it cuts away, she might have a martini glass, and it'll cut back, and it'll be, like, a highball glass. And uh, it's a different type of alcohol beverage in every single shot. I was still focused on the uh, the pimento that I wasn't paying attention to the glass. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know it was every shot. I knew it was every scene. That's amazing. Yeah, and maybe I miss uh, misspoke there, Miss Her, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, that's what they said. And I was trying to watch for it. It seems like it goes pretty rapid fire. She goes through like six different glasses, and I don't think she's in that many scenes. Yeah, and her character is it's so perfect in this episode. Like she's not utilized too often. Every time she's in there, she has something really funny slash mean to say <laughs> uh like i i really enjoyed that character she was very well written a, l- a lot of her lines are great but actually when uh her the description of her later is probably my favorite line in the episode but we'll we'll get there we'll get there <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's twice we've we've had an allusion to miles's favorite line in the episode ladies and gentlemen <laughs> I, I probably said one i can have Allie on the board favorite. it's fine uh, they're talking about all the different things that they can order uh, through the the mail, and Marge is trying to relate, but it's in a different way, because you see every month, good housekeeping arrives in her mailbox, bursting with recipes, and sometimes the most satisfying meal is the one you cook yourself. Hmm, that's so true, Marge. One night, Whiff and I came home late. We decided not to wake Iris, so instead, we microwaved our own soup. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was a horrible mess, but Iris didn't mind cleaning it up. 
So this really paints a great picture of the type of people that Marge is trying to fit in with at this point. And that's all well and good, but at one point, Evelyn kind of dismissed the family. They she, they were standing awkwardly in the doorway, to be fair, so it was, it was pretty weird. <laughs> She's like, you know, you can go and enjoy the club. So we cut to the rest of the family for a little bit, and Bart is uh, talking about how weird... They're back at home, and Bart is talking about how weird that place was, because there is a man in the bathroom who just kept handing him towels until he paid him to stop. Without <laughs> longer, boy. <laughs> stack of towels in his hands. Lisa points <laughs> out that the rich are just different from you and me. Yes, they're better. And uh, Marge goes on to talk about how she did such a good job of fitting in, and she hopes that the rest of the family did the same. But she did such a good job that they've actually received guest passes, and uh, they might be invited to join. You know, Homer's going to have a couple lines in this episode that, like, Everybody would think, but nobody would ever say. And one was whenever they were standing in the doorway, when he was like, come on, let's go wait in the car till your mother's done fitting in. Like, that's something you would never say out loud, but everybody would think. And then he has one of those at the end when Marge is walking away from the family for a second. And I just I just thought that was kind of interesting, the, the two lines in particular. It might be because he's written at the same intelligence as a dog, so he just speaks his mind without thinking of, like, the social faux pas, but it works really well as kind of a running narration of what the family is experiencing as Marge is trying to fit in. Well, I think it's typically Lisa that's the one that has, like, the audience point of view on on her commentary, but I, I don't think either of those lines would work with Lisa in this episode. Like, it wouldn't have the same impact as, like, the... um the sorrowful Homer or, you know, the, sure. the stupid idiot buffoon with the heart of gold Homer sort of thing. And when he says it, it's just like, oh, the only people that are really or that least is the voice for, I should say, in this episode are people who really love ponies. <laughs> <laughs> we see at the club later that Bart and Lisa are watching Kent Brockman's daughter actually turn away a bologna sandwich, telling the server, I asked for an abalone sandwich. Which is a joke that Josh Weinstein said that he had had on deck forever and just wanted to put somewhere and didn't know where. And when this came up, it was just kind of that match made in heaven where he knew that this was its moment to shine. And I think he, uh, <laughs> he hit it out of the park. <laughs> and this is actually the first time where we do see Lisa starting to get distracted by that pony. Before this, she's uh, kind of on her soapbox talking about how uh, the breakdown of uh, and division of classes is wrong, and how this isn't really a, the, this isn't the environment that they should be in. Uh, and then she sees the ponies or the horses, really, uh, but she calls it a pony. And, and like, it's actually a really funny uh, scene where she's trying to like make her point, but when the horse comes by, like her neck is just following it along, and it even changes the sound effect, like the wow as she's going by. <laughs> and she starts replacing words with horse. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> I do love the idea that the family went back to the country club a second time because obviously Marge wants to like fit in. So she wouldn't really want them there, but they were pretty bored the first time around. I love that. They just kept going to support Marge, <laughs> like just a little like subtlety of that uh, love and support by the family. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It is really cool. And you're right. They're clearly, I mean, it's an act of love. It's a, it's a sacrifice for, uh, for everybody but yeah. Marge to be there. Uh, until Lisa has her turning point. Right. And especially for kids, like, uh, when I was that age, doing anything at any time on like a weekend was hell. Like, <laughs> I wanted to just sit at home and watch TV all the time. Oh, all the time. Dude, I remember I had to go to a, a wedding once when I was a kid, and I actually ended up breaking my arm like right before going, and my parents for a bit were convinced that I was just trying to get out of going to the wedding. And I'm like, <laughs> no, like this thing is That broken. sounds like you. <laughs> uh, I legit had broken my wrist, though, so like it was... Uh, but it was just... It was such the mindset of that time of like, oh, I don't want to have to do that like you i have two days two days and you want me to go to a wedding like weddings are the most boring thing ever when you're a kid like until you go to a wedding where you're of age and there's an open bar weddings suck like it's just the truth sorry 
<laughs> yeah, you have to wear like a stiff suit. Yeah. And, yeah, they're not good. They're not fun. They're not fun. But you're right. That makes the sacrifice that the family shows here even that more impactful. Yeah, because they're literally standing there doing nothing in that shot. Like, <laughs> I think they're watching other people eat at that point. Yeah, I guess they're not uh, a fan of that. The simplicity of that is weird. <laughs> True. So, yeah. Meanwhile, though, Marge is still getting along pretty well. Uh, she is up playing, uh, what was it, hearts with her friends? Or was it spades? It was a card game where you have to collect suits. It was bridge. She was playing bridge. Uh, and she realized that she had the winning hand, and there's this great, great flip on the classic Simpsons talking to your own brain, uh, this time with Marge, which is really rare. But Marge is essentially thinking of what she should do, because she, she realizes she has the winning hand, and we start panning up her up her hair, essentially. We first see the top of her head, and it just keeps going higher and higher and higher and higher, and it's like, we better be careful. The purpose of this game is to make friends. We don't make friends by winning. Still, there's nothing more popular than a gracious winner. And we finally and pan up. all the way to the top. Don't ask me. I'm just hair. Your head ended 18 <laughs> inches ago. <laughs> the commentary points out that we learned that Marge's hair is 18 inches in this uh, episode. So, for what it's worth. Yeah, that's kind of a weird thing. Because um, 18 inches, that makes her body, just by relativity, like... That means that Marge is two foot tall. Yeah, she's probably the shortest, the shortest. The shortest Simpson. Not yeah, counting hair. Sure. I mean, if, <laughs> if her hair is only eighteen inches, just comparing it to the size of her body, right. uh, she's a very short person. <laughs> and there's another one of those moments uh, in in one of these episodes through here where Homer gains a lot of weight. Um, like it says, that he starts out at two hundred and forty pounds, but he plays this like gluttonous character, and it's like two hundred and forty pounds is not that big. <laughs> we uh, were talking about to, that. Like, yeah, we've talked a lot about that. <laughs> the, it's actually for what's it's, it's a lean two thirty nine, David. Uh, <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. I forgot where the pig started off on the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's uh, King Size Homer, which is a, a fantastic episode, and you're right, though, it's, we, we've talked a lot, like, when we were kids, we were like, 239, that seems unreasonably big, but, like, you know, we're not that far from there. Ah, <laughs> uh, the, uh, different view we have now, compared to then. <laughs> yeah, stay away from that Play-Doh. Well, Marge decides to make a bold move, and good for her, she should, and she goes ahead and plays her hand and says, I believe the rest are ours, and Susan is a little bit upset with, or Roberta, I should say, is a little bit upset with Susan, Roberta. because uh, had they had changed suits or changed to a different suit, they could have won. I thought that perhaps changing suits had gone out of fashion. A March. Hmm. What a bitch. Uh, <laughs> that is such a mean thing to say. And it's so true, though, because we are very clearly seeing Marge in the same thing over and over and over again. And to drive this point home, every other woman in the scene is seen uh, with a different outfit every single time. And that actually became a bit of a nightmare for the animation department because we talk so many times about how certain episodes like a Treehouse of Horror or a Vacation episode are so challenging because they have to create so much. To some extent, that is what happened here because for each of these characters, they had to build multiple models wearing multiple outfits. Which is why you only see a few days at the country club. <laughs> Well, yeah, and the set piece in general, like, we've never seen the country club before. Right, right, yeah. Much less mentioned like, before. <laughs> yeah, much less like the country club, like, golf course, the dining room, uh, sorry, the dining, like, patio or wherever they were at, the parlor where they were playing bridge, like, it's all fresh. Right, yeah, and that, that just puts more work on the animation department because they have to create everything new. It does Absolutely. make the uh, the episode, though. I think it's it's subtle, but I really do think it makes a bigger impact on on the stress and the burden that it puts on Marge. That especially the scenes where we see her at the sewing machine, they talk about in the commentary too that these are some of the most memorable scenes from a um, visual standpoint. And it's not that particularly anything ha is really interesting happening. It's just that the determination and the emotion that Marge has on her face. Uh, is really 
really powerful, and uh, therefore, when they talk about this episode, that's usually the the first image that people have in their mind. Oh, that's a really good point, actually, because you can totally see all that in her face while she's doing that. Right. Good observation, Simpson staff. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, we talked a lot about how the rest of the Simpsons family is kind of getting bored with the situation, but they are trying to find ways to enjoy themselves, and Homer decides that he's going to give golf a try, and at first it doesn't seem to be going too well, because all he does is hit himself in the foot, and then when he discovers cheating at golf by changing your scorecard the pro for the club comes out who is actually tom kite and lets him know that traditionally when you cheat at golf you lower your score (laughs) (laughs) so this is actual pga golf pro tom kite who is actually born in mckinney texas and what's really interesting about him is he actually spent 175 weeks in the top 10 of the official world golf rankings between 1989 and 1994. So I don't believe he ever got all the way to the top, but he held in the top 10 for five, four and a half years, essentially. Yeah, I was huge into golf growing up, and Tom Kite was good. <laughs> like, he was consistent, as you say, but he wasn't, like, a memorable character. <laughs> so it is kind of like a perfect mix of, like, a really good golfer, so it's funny that they would just be a club pro at this country club, <laughs> but also a kind of boring golfer, where it's like, oh, isn't it funny that this person is on The Simpsons? It's like that level. <laughs> it's like, ah. Uh, it's almost it's like a, they took that, that concept of where they'll have just like a name that they'll randomly use for a joke and, and just kind of a throwaway mm-hmm. gag, but they just decided to go full force with it and actually bring him on the show to do it. But yeah, it's a very... He's just kind of there a lot. It's really funny. Yeah, and he's got a relatively unique style. Like, he's one of the only golfers ever, especially a, like, famous golfer, that wore, like, a wide-brimmed hat that went all the way around. Oh, wow. Uh, So it kind of makes me feel like, oh, they probably just wanted Tom Kite because they knew he would be visually interesting. And then they just laughed when Tom Kite said, yes, he would be on the show. Perfect. (laughs) So they could actually put him on there. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Miles, you didn't tell me that there's somebody that knew a lot about golf coming on our program today. <laughs> it's news to me too, brother. It's news to me too. Honestly, please. Don't I, I'm learning things up. about David. I'm not sure I wanted to know. He doesn't like Bart, and he loves golf. Like, what is happening right now? <laughs> I should clarify. Uh, I like Bart. No, it's a, <laughs> just, just like March. I like Bart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, point out, too, Tom Kite has actually uh, said that he really enjoyed working on the show. He loved being a part of it. It was really fun for him to imagine what Homer's golf swing was going to look like. But he actually, at one point, kind of got scared that he was worried that Homer would end up having a better golf swing than he did. (laughs) (laughs) Homer catches on pretty quick. He does, actually. And it's fun. That's another interesting thing, too, about this episode is... Other than socially, Homer actually fits in pretty well here. Like, he, he yeah. starts to kind of find his uh, groove a little bit. And uh, he even, you know, is able to maybe not use some of the best strategy, but he's even able to get closer and make moves at his own work through this country club, which is like the politicking 101 of country clubs. But it's it's funny to see Homer kind of in his element despite himself. Yeah, it's fun just to see Homer good at something. Yeah. Which is another thing that I love about this episode is that so consistently he is like the screw up who doesn't understand like skills or behaviors or anything. Um, But to see him actually like achieve something, especially something that like a lot of the audience at least understands that golf is difficult. So it's super absurd that he would be good at it so quick. Um, it's just fun. It's like, oh, he has an actual talent. Yay. Good job, Omer. It is. It's always fun to see, like, because we're so used to him just being the buffoon, and he's really not yeah. in this episode. There's even the times that he might be, he's essentially curbed by Marge so that he doesn't act out. Oh. Well, <laughs> it, it's okay. There's a sweet ending, Richie. I don't want, I, I don't want you to oh, be okay. sad. It'll be, it'll be all right. 
So this is actually the night where we see Marge at that scene I was talking about where she's sewing her or altering her suit, I should say. She's trying to make it look like a completely new outfit uh, because she doesn't want to spend the money. And she, you know, is now embarrassed because she was called out by Suzanne, uh, Susan, whatever. And it's there's at one point where Homer's just talking about golf. He's actually reading a golf book. I uh, failed to catch what it was, but it's he's in bed now and he's just becoming obsessed with golf to the point where he's kind of annoying Marge a little bit talking about it. Marge is hyper focused. Homer's just like, eh, whatever. Throw some bumper stickers on it and come to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that would go over well. But, of course, that's not what Marge does. She works through the night, and she actually very successfully alters the look of her suit. And now it is, in fact, a completely new outfit. And it's even getting praised by Roberta, uh, who says, it's great. She loves it. The vest says, let's have lunch. But the culottes say you're paying. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very specific phrasing there. So, yeah, go Marge. And also, like, a little bit of a burn. Uh, Yeah, exactly. It's like like... that subtle burn is exactly what it is. It's staying true to the characteristics that we've seen so far with these women. Yep. Yeah. Uh, We also see Lisa come by, and she's very proud to exclaim as she's riding a a horse that, Mom, look, I found something more fun than complaining. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lisa. Uh, Marge is getting very excited because it, she realizes that if Saturday's ball goes well, then she, or she, I'm sorry, she's actually told that if Saturday's ball goes well, that they're going to sponsor Marge for membership. Marge is excited and says, I'll be there with bells on. Where exactly will you be attaching them to that mangled Chanel suit? Oh, once again, uh, Susan... Every line that she has is a home run. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's so catty, man. It's amazing. Like, it's, and it's, yeah, everything yeah. is so, it's it's right on. And, and you again, it's paired so well with the animation because you can really see the embarrassment in Marge's face. And I feel like embarrassment is a difficult thing to draw, but they, they do it very well. Well, and it just makes you root for Marge even more. It'd be like, it'd be pretty easy to, as a viewer, just be like, eh. Who cares if they get into a country club? They're not going to be able to afford it anyway. Right. They're not uh, that sort yes. of people. <laughs> but then, like, when people are actively hating Marge, I just want to, like, jump through the screen and just be like, hey, Susan, just calm down. Yeah. Like, Marge needs this. <laughs> she really, really needs yeah, this. Yeah, you're, you're ruining this for a very nice lady. Yeah, you just, like, root for them so much more because of the terrible things that they say to them. Yeah, a hundred percent. And again, though the the delivery of these lines by these voice, uh, but it's like Tress McNeil and uh, who does Millhouse? I'm blanking. Uh, and Maud. It's it's basically every woman, uh, every voice acting woman that they have on staff is in this episode because there's a lot of characters that are female by comparison to some of the other episodes, and they all just do such a solid job. In fact. Uh, I'm flat out declaring this next line my favorite line of the episode, uh, the top spot, due to the fact that it's uh, Susan kind of sees, or I'm sorry, uh, it's um, Evelyn notices that Marge is upset by Susan's line, and she's like, don't worry, Marge. Susan's idea of wit is nothing more than an incisive observation humorously phrased and delivered with impeccable timing. <laughs> <laughs> that gets me every time. Ugh. At work uh, for Homer, he's kind of showing off his newfound golf skills, and he's chipping into toilet seats, which is really fun. In fact, when he's asked if he could hit the handicap stall, he tells Lenny to put the toilet seat down. Boom. (laughs) But, of course, Burns is watching from that ivory tower of his, uh, looking on at his newfound golf competition, it would seem, as he's got a reputation to protect and that he has only ever lost one golf game in his life, and it was to Nixon when he let him win. Well, and Smithers and Burns comment on Burns' waggle. <laughs> Showing his golfers. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Burns is actually excited by the challenge, for what it's worth. He, he wants to play somebody who he feels like can, can give him a run for his money. Bah, schedule a game, and I'll ask him myself. <laughs> I love when uh, he, he confuses or he asks Smithers, uh, 
I wonder if Homer Nixon is any relation. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely, sir. They spell and pronounce their names. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he's like been to their house. It, it, he should know this. He should know Homer oh. at least. But I mean, that's one of the the fun recurring jokes of the entire series is who is this blah 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 of sector seven G? It's like oh, that's that's Homer. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a fun like uh, juxtaposition where he feels that way about like his own employees, but then when he has a peer at the country club, he just becomes best friends with them yeah. immediately. Yeah, that's true. I love how he calls him a laboratory linksman in this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who is that laboratory linksman, Smithers? I really appreciate the way they kind of flip this scene, because Marge had the scene earlier with the bridge game, where she was kind of debating in her mind, like, okay, should I beat them, or should I lay down and lose, or how should I handle this socially, potentially awkward situation? Homer has a different plan. This game could be big things for me, Marge. If I beat Mr. Burns, and I mean really wallop him bad, I'm sure to get that big raise I've been gunning for. <laughs> <laughs> well, Homer always loves taking Burns down a peg, which, like, that's, you know, any every man's dream is to show their boss what's up. Like, the, um, the, the episode that's like the Citizen Kane one uh, in, like, season three or four. Rosebud, uh, yeah. Where, Rosebud. Yeah, yeah. Where Homer gets to like uh, roast com <laughs> roast Mr. Burns, um, <laughs> yeah. he's like so excited to like you know really give it to him, um, and it's so <laughs> so odd and like misguided and unfair, but so funny that it's consistent. He always wants to take down Mr. Burns, and it seems like in this one he might get an opportunity to. Yeah, and I think he's right. Shot. He'll get a raise if he does it this time too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marge insists that if he does win, he doesn't do any of his woohoos. They cannot afford <laughs> a single slip up. They're judging us. And that's when we see Marge once again, uh, s literally sweating over the sewing machine as she's trying to now take this already altered outfit and make it into yet a new outfit. And you can really see the stress getting to her. Things are made worse when Lisa is at maybe the most of an eight-year-old girl she's ever been, and she is just so excited. Maybe uh, the Corey hotline, but it's it's real close. But she's never been this excited about a horse on camera, even when they almost got her one. I mean, she's, like, on the bed jumping and exclaiming, like, Mom, do you like horses when you're my age? Because I do. And it, she just keeps going on and on and on until Marge finally actually kind of snaps at her and tells her, like, look, tonight's very important, and Mommy has to alter her suit so it looks like a totally new suit. And the Simpsons did it before a family guy with the mom, 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 mom. Yeah, definitely. And it's basically the same concept. Exactly. <laughs> but this eventually, it gets to the point where she kind of shushes Lisa, but she then, and, and she actually finishes her outfit. But right at the last minute with, uh, when she has her full on meltdown, she accidentally hits the foot pedal for the sewing machine and it causes her newly finished suit to get basically ruined. For I, I don't really understand the mechanics of sewing machines well enough to understand exactly what happened, but this, this suit is now fucked. Like, it's not going to look good in any way, shape, or form. The end of the suit was still, like, in the sewing machine, so when she put the hit the, the pedal, it's supposed to feed it and, and sew and... It just mangles the whole thing. If she would have just p taken two steps back, she would have been set. Yeah. And this actually leads to another joke that I absolutely adore in this episode, though it honestly feels like a, a Merkin moment more than anything, because uh, Marge has a mental breakdown right here and realizes, you know, at times like this, I guess that all you can do is laugh. And then we see her sit in complete silence. And the, they actually, uh, Susie Dieter talked about how they drug this out longer than most shots, even when they pull this joke, because it held for a full five seconds of just Marge staring blankly into the distance, not making a sound. And it's one of those things that it's a really dark joke, but uh, it, like kind of perfectly peers into Marge's psyche at this time. Exactly. Yeah, that's my favorite joke in the entire episode, and like one of my favorite in the entire series. Oh yeah, it's so just good. the simplicity of that is just beautiful. Because 
that's also how I tend to react to things. I just get very quiet. Oh no. <laughs> and then start processing. Wow. Uh, so it's, I loved it. I love, love, love it. And that five seconds of silence actually brings us to the end of our second act. We're going to take another very quick break and we'll be right back with the conclusion of scenes from the class struggle in Springfield. Every year, new TV shows get canceled. Some make it an entire season, and some don't even make it that far. I'm Ed, host of Unaired, where each week we review a show that was canceled with episodes left unaired, then pitch our ideas for what could have been future episodes of those shows. We've covered shows like Cavemen, the show based on the Geico Cavemen commercials, the ill-fated 2011 Wonder Woman pilot, a show called Look Well, where Adam West plays an aging TV detective who thinks he can solve real crimes, and many more. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, unairedpodcast.com, or wherever you download podcasts. And remember, some things are better left unaired. Back for our final act, and we see Marge desperate for help and turning to her sisters to try to find an outfit, a formal dress that she can wear to the club tonight. You've come to the right place. Oh, I did the crusty. <laughs> <laughs> you got classy every time I try to do yin-yang. every time I try to do Patty or Summer, I always go to Krusty for some reason. I keep telling you, man. Every time we do Patty or Summer, we just need to po- uh, smoke a pack of cigarettes before we record. It'll be perfect. We won't. It's we'll do the a... whole show as Patty and Selma at that point, but it's fine. Yeah, small sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, we immediately see a sequence of disaster outfits for Marge. The, there are a couple of logistic questions I have, because the first one, the first dress, uh, which I think was made of entirely made of vinyl, uh, Marge is like swimming in this thing, but then she tries on what was originally a Halloween the- costume that ended up in the rotation, <laughs> and it's like skin tight to the point where like, was it a legging for Selma or Patty? Oh no, you just saw everything. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I wish this scene was like 10 minutes long. I could have seen, uh, I could have loved, I would have loved to have watched like Marge try on like every single ridiculous outfit that Patty and Selma have. I'm sad that I only get like two examples of it. You know, uh, that's man, actually really that's interesting that you, you bring that up because uh, I mentioned oh. at the top of the episode <laughs> that this, uh, this episode ran really long. And yeah. unfortunately for Susie Dieter and Jennifer Crittenden, they ended up having to cut a lot of their more zany gags because uh, there was so much of this episode that they felt that was essential to the story that when they were cutting for time and it really only came down to they had to they had to throw away some pretty good jokes, actually, that were really funny and would have made many other episodes if there was time. Uh, I don't know specifically that there were any more of this specific scene, but I could definitely see this being a scene that might have been trimmed up because of that. Uh, However, it it really worked out well because of the new showrunners. Again, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein, this is still early on in their, their takeover of the show, and they felt that this was exactly the type of episode that they were looking for to really drive home that family focus that they were wanting to bring back to the Simpsons that they felt they got away from under the Merkin era. Not that they were dogging the Merkin era by any means, but that just wasn't his focus as much. And that's what they were kind of wanting to see as their vision. So uh, it ended up being something that even though they lost several of the jokes they would have liked to have kept, it really made for a powerful story that got told through this episode. Yes. Sorry, I was doing a future joke we're about to get to. I jumped ahead. To <laughs> uh, so we see that Homer is now meeting up for his golf game with Burns, and it's seemingly not going very well for Homer, not because he's playing bad, but Mr. Burns is surprisingly good at golf. It seems that every shot he takes goes right to the green like a magnet almost it's uh he's just a really solid golfer yes and homer's vainglorious boasting will only add savor to burns's inevitable triumph <laughs> yes <laughs> there you go yeah full circle people <laughs> perfect <laughs> uh there's another uh as Homer's trying to put out of a sand trap, he Burns has a, a really perfect Burns line. Just in, it's a line that would only make sense coming out of Mister Burns. 
Oh, quit cogitating, Steinmunts. Use an open face club, the sand wedge. Mmm, open face club sandwich. <laughs> uh, the cogitating Steinmetz is a reference to something really old and to do with electricity, and I had it up and I don't anymore, and I'm just going to leave it at that. It, it's an old guy who <laughs> discovered something with electricity. <laughs> That's the type of research you get right here on the best side of the <laughs> show. And he had no open club sandwich while doing so. No. That we know of. Also, I feel like the open-faced club sandwich misunderstanding joke was probably on their board for a long time. And I could have seen them, like, building this entire golf storyline just so that they can deliver that joke in a justified way. <laughs> yeah, it's, I could see that as well. Because it's a good joke. It's kind of like the one... Uh... Uh, the bologna versus abalone thing, like earlier, it's like you, yeah. just, like, you have to find that right moment. <laughs> yeah, but like the bologna abalone thing, like okay, cool, people are going to be eating in like almost every episode. True, but this to is get a, to do a golf specific joke, yeah, um, yeah, they had to do an entire golf set piece. <laughs> well. Homer and Burns are golfing head to head. We see that Marge is kind of freaking out at this point because she has nothing to wear, nothing in her sister's closet worked out, and she is racing back to Ogdenville to the outlet mall, trying to find anything that she can. Uh, she asks if there's a Chanel suit or any other high quality clothes, and the saleswoman <laughs> replies, No, ma'am, but we do have a shipment of slightly burned Sears activewear coming in this afternoon. Oh, I give up. What time and how burnt? <laughs> <laughs> Love Cletus. Uh, this is all kind of uh, cutting back and forth. We see this scene of Marge trying to track down the or at the outlet mall with Homer and Burns getting their golf game on. Homer had just hit Krusty in the head on accident in the previous scene too by throwing his club really far away and. I'm glad it's not you looking good that for out. Krusty. Yeah, that's the second assault on Krusty at this point on this golf course. This is where we discover that the reason Mr. Burns is so good at golf is due to the fact that it turns out that Smithers has been cheating for him this entire time. He gets hit in the head with a golf ball and actually goes down and all of the embroidered or the monogrammed Golf balls, <laughs> embroidered golf balls is a really funny idea, actually. But uh, the monogram <laughs> golf balls uh, fall out of his pocket, though he quickly tries to deny it, saying they're just reptile eggs and, and they're endangered. <laughs> Step away. Homer and actually Homer puts, puts one, one in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the only way you can determine if it's an authentic reptile egg. Exactly. <laughs> uh, he decides they're not. He spits them out and just says, no, you've been cheating. <gasps> cheating for me why smithers that's patently unnecessary i'm one of the world's finest golfers <laughs> why in all the years you've caddied for me i've never lost a uh, oh. <laughs> and burns realizes that he may have been having a secret weapon all along uh, and i think it's interesting to note here that Burns really isn't the bad guy in this episode as much as he normally is. In fact, it's much more of Smithers doing the dirty work on his behalf. Uh, Burns was, in fact, unknowledgeable and technically innocent in this uh, regard. Thank you, Lord yeah, Miles. <laughs> well, that's another fun thing about this episode. Is I mentioned earlier like how you see different sides of the character. For Burns not to be the mastermind is a completely different thing than you normally see from Burns. He well, just thought he was good he's at golf. Not at work. He's just golfing. He's he's, yeah. he's in his relaxed time. He doesn't need to mastermind right now. We need to see more Burns at the country club because he's just a chill dude. Yeah. It's what I don't understand bad. is why was Smithers on the green while Homer was swinging when he knows Homer can hit it a pretty good ways away? Like he should have waited till Homer uh, took his shot and then ran out there to mess with that. He he messed up there. He's got to make sure he's got enough time to not be seen making the switch. And I mean, you don't think that you're going to get hit in the head with a, a golf ball ever, really. But no, I agree. He he definitely made a mistake there and paid the price. For someone who's paid been cheating price. that long, I mean. Yeah. Be a better cheater, Smithers. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just lower his score on the scorecard like a gentleman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just lie. <laughs> The gentleman's way. <laughs> so, 
Homer and, or I'm sorry, Smithers and Burns immediately start to bribe Homer for his silence on this matter as Burns' reputation is at stake. And, you know, if he did stay hush on this, they could recommend or sponsor him for membership tonight. And while that's not important to Homer, they do point out, yes, but is it important to your wife? Ooh. Yeah, the kryptonite. So (laughs) Homer is dejected and he walks away. He actually steps on Krusty's like collapsed body at this point. Uh, We get a pretty funny line where uh, Krusty looks up in pain. is like, I knew my kind wasn't welcome here. Now on the commentary, they mentioned that they just think the club must not appreciate clowns. But I think (laughs) that uh, that may have been a reference to the very unfortunate treatment of certain clubs against the Jewish population. Uh, I think in the past, hopefully not still today, but I don't know. It was a Jew joke. That was the idea. (laughs) Or a clown joke, if you want to think of it in a more positive light. And why didn't you say that with your Selma and Patty voice, Miles? (laughs) So... It's getting down to the moment of truth here. It's uh, the night of the ball, and Marge is at an all-time high level of stress. She's got the family ready, and she has come down the stairs with her new dress that everyone thinks she altered at this point. In fact, they're really impressed at the way that they at, that she altered it, but she explains, no, no, I got it at the outlet mall, and I paid a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first one was $90. This one was a hell of a deal. Oh, yeah. It looks a lot fancier, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there's also a moment where Lisa is kind of doing the eight-year-old thing again, where she's, like, uh, questioning just every little thing about the dress. And Marge, again, for the second time, snaps at Lisa in this episode, quickly shutting her up. And she's even like, I just wanted to say that you look nice is all. Ooh. Yeah, you can kind of see the, the breakdown of... Uh, Marge right right here at this point. They pull up to the country club and Homer is ecstatic because they have valet parking. (laughs) Marge goes on, we can't drive up there. They'll see the tent. They'll see the coat hanger antenna. (laughs) Stop the car. We're walking. But Marge, valets, maybe for once someone will call me sir without adding, you're making a scene. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but Marge is not having it. They clearly park pretty far away because they're walking through the hills towards the main building. And the family is once again seemingly trying to, like, have a good time of it. They're, they're trying to enjoy it. Homer says he's going to regale everybody with his antidote. You know, the one he tried to say on the radio. <laughs> Who's going to bleep me this time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pose as an Italian count and get some old lady to leave me all her money. Lisa's is pretty funny, too. She's going to ask everybody for their first name, first and last names, except for the servants. She's just going to ask them for their their first names. <laughs> but Marge is having none of any of it. She says, not tonight, no vulgarity, no mischief, no politics, just be good. And instantly the entire family goes quiet. Bart and Lisa apologize. They say, uh, Lisa says, I won't say anything controversial and this one's kind of sad. It, it's, it hits the heart a little bit when Homer says, I just won't say anything, okay, honey? Even Maggie sucks on her pacifier in agreement. Well, no, she sucks on her pacifier and then Marge glares at her. Oh, yeah, you're right. Like, yep, you're quiet right. up, kind of. Uh, it is noteworthy, too, that this is actually the first and only appearance of Maggie in the entire episode. Yeah, where was she during the country club and all the other scenes? With Grandpa, I guess. There you go. Yeah, Grandpa or the Flanders. I saved it. (laughs) (laughs) I guess they just didn't want to pay the voice actor for that episode. (laughs) (laughs) So, the line here that is kind of the final straw that breaks everything, as Marge is storming towards the main building, Homer says, You kids should thank your mother. Now that she's a better person, we can see how awful we really are. And when Marge hears this, you can instantly see in her face, it it breaks her heart, and she turns around and comes running back to her family. Uh, I will say that that line, I think, is interesting, because if it were said by, 
literally any other character on the show, it would have been, or any show, it would have been a super passive-aggressive move. But I do believe, just due to, again, the fact that Homer is written with the intelligent the intelligence of a dog in mind. I don't think that was necessarily in his intentions, but if, if you think about that line being delivered by literally anywhere else, it's, it's insanely passive aggressive. That's kind of what we were alluding to earlier in our discussion of this episode too, is, and especially the way Homer delivers it, where he is kind of like the, the shameful dog that knows he did something wrong, even though he didn't. <laughs> As I say, it's almost like a step further than that. It's like when you're having a bad day and like you yell at your dog when you're like, I, my dog didn't do anything. I'm just having a bad day, man. Like you feel so guilty. And it's just like, he's just being a dog. But Miles, um, why did you get so angry with me? My name's right. Nash. <laughs> oh, you made it too real. I need to go apologize to my puppy. <laughs> so Marge has kind of a, you know, a, she comes back to reality a little bit, and she tells Homer that she loves his in-your-face humanity. She loves the way Lisa speaks her mind, and this is a, such a great line we talked about l- earlier. She looks at Bart, and she says, I like Bart's, and Bart kind of looks mm-hmm. sad for just a moment as she doesn't finish the sentence, but then she comes back with, I like Bart. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Bart sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's not a strong case for his intelligence because he's very quickly, sli- I don't know if he's swindled by Brzee, but it's enough to, to satisfy him. It puts a big old smile on his face. He just wants yeah, to be for appreciated. Sure. Yeah, I guess so. And Marge goes on to say that she likes her green dress and she is upset because of all the money that they spent on this gown. In fact, it was all of their savings. But don't worry, she kept the receipt, and they're going to be able to get a store credit for however much at Chanel. $3,300 oh, is God. what she said for that but dress. But it's fine as long as, uh, it's fine with Homer as long as they sell beer and gum there. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Marge decides, you know what, we should go. I wouldn't want to join any club that would have this me as a member. And that quote is actually a paraphrase quote by Groucho Marx, who essentially said the exact same thing. Like, he wouldn't want to be a part of any group that would have him as a member. Hmm. Look at Miles throwing some knowledge on you. Love it. Boom, some knowledge. Boom, boom, some knowledge. What? <laughs> um, yeah, that was for you, David. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so... Lisa even points out it really doesn't matter all along anyway because it's not like those snobs are ever going to make them members. Except they totally were. Because when we cut to inside the ballroom, we see that they have a giant banner set up for them. It's a huge, ga- it's a huge gala uh, welcoming the Simpsons to the club. Uh, another great couple of lines by the women that were uh, supporting or sponsoring Marge's membership or whatever when uh, Susan points out, she's like, I really hope my attempt to destroy her too, or she didn't take my attempt to destroy her too seriously. <laughs> Slurp. Sipping yet another drink. And even Burns, man, Burns baked Homer a cake to congratulate him coming <laughs> oh. into the club. And he, he remembered his name and spelt it correctly. Yeah, it was a complete mess that looked disgusting, but it was the thought that counts. I pickled the figs myself. <laughs> oh. And we finally end the episode with a classic Simpsons reset where the family sits around at a Krusty Burger eating and the squeaky voice teen that works there, I love this because he asks, wow, hey, did you guys just come from the prom? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, Marge points out that they realize that they're more comfortable in a place like this. And I love how the, the squeaky voice scene's nodding and then realizing what they actually said. <laughs> like, what? Man, you're crazy. This place is a dump. <laughs> and then it continues uh, to do... mumble as they pull away. Yeah, like d- degrading the restaurant, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do like uh, just a reference to the ongoing fact that Lisa is now a vegetarian. And again, they made that non-contractual, just a handshake agreement uh, with Paul McCartney, actually, that Lisa would be a vegetarian from that episode, Lisa the Vegetarian Forward. And true to their word, Lisa is only eating french fries in the scene. Oh, look at that. That's terrible parenting, though, by the way, if she's not getting actual food. 
Well, I'm sure she's getting her protein from other sources. <laughs> yeah, I think it's wonderful parenting because you're letting your kid yeah. uh, make a lifestyle choice in that way. Good, good yeah. support, parents. Love it. I love it. And that brings us to the end of the episode. Scenes from the class struggle in Springfield. David, first of all, thank you so much for joining us here today, man. This was a blast talking to you. You're clearly a super fan of The Simpsons. Very knowledgeable and very funny, of course. So we love having you on the show. Is there anything else that you wanted to point out about this episode that we may have missed today? Or Bart. <laughs> yeah, or or your thoughts on how terrible a character Bart is. Uh, you know what? Uh, I'll use this time... <laughs> to talk about my favorite thing about Bart, which is that his formal suit has shorts. Oh, yes. Just like his father's <laughs> uh, suit top. I love his little short suit. Um, that is no, I think, I think we got everything. Very cool. Well, thank you again so much for coming on the show, man. It really was a blast talking to you. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to nerd out about The Simpsons with us here today. I appreciate the opportunity to do it. I mean... I'm sure that people uh, in my circle of friends are tired of me bringing up The Simpsons all the time. So <laughs> it's it's cool to be in a setting where uh, that's not only like allowed, but encouraged. <laughs> encouraged, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to encourage you to push this episode on those friends. So. Absolutely, uh, yeah. <laughs> take it, take it. Get, yeah, let's get some subscribers. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Richie, what about you, sir? Is there anything else that you uh, or that book of yours want to point out about this episode? I wanted to point out, we, we skipped over Tom Kite teaching Homer about golf, but the one, <laughs> yeah. line, the one line where he tells Homer, you know, pretend there's no one else here, and Homer scratches his butt with the <laughs> yeah. club and burps, and then he goes, and just go at your own pace. I never noticed this before, but Homer hit the ball, like, before he said, go at your own pace, and he kind of looks at him real quick, and I, I just, I guess I just wasn't paying full attention to that moment earlier, but I love how he was literally going at his own pace before he even said it, where, like, he mastered the art without really trying at all, and I just kind of played into that. So I enjoyed that. My biggest complaint with this episode, and it, it all ties up in a nice bow, so I can't complain about it, is that they never bring up the price of membership with The Simpsons, because yeah. Marge just blew their life savings on that dress. If they would have gone inside and been made members, there's a monthly fee or a yearly fee to be in a country club. So, like, oh, wow. I wanted to know how much that was or, like, I, like I, uh, it, just, it was really killing me because like, it was like they were going to go bankrupt immediately if they actually became members. Interesting. No contingency. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, but that's kind of, the, like, the fun of it is that this is Marge finally treating herself. Yeah, And, like, there's really no answer where it's like, oh, even if it's $10 a month <laughs> based on previous episodes, that would probably be way too much. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's like a huge plot hole. Like, yeah, they're never going to be able to afford this at all. It's like a get huge... some more guest passes, please? Yeah, exactly. It's a <laughs> yeah. huge blessing that yes. they had that, um, that, that realization moment outside of the club. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, a very good point. It could have actually really put them into some dire straits for sure. Uh, the only other thing I have on this episode, we talked about a little bit last week uh, that they were doing a font change, not with the actual Simpsons title card, but with all of the credited uh, writers, producers, the people that make the show. Uh, there is a font change, and this is the first episode that goes on for the rest of the series of that font change. Now, I'll be honest, I tried to do some more research into this other than just what they mentioned briefly on the commentary. I could not really find any solid examples of uh, comparing the two fonts, but it, to me it has to be very, very subtle because uh, it doesn't seem that different. But they, they claim it's there, and I found multiple <laughs> sources saying such. Just go with it, man. <laughs> I guess so. The uh, last thing is on the commentary at the end of this episode, uh, Josh Weinstein and Bill Oakley kind of had the realization that they may have accidentally made the moral of this story to stay in your place and not bother <laughs> trying to better yourself. Uh, <laughs> which uh, I guess could be said about a lot of the Simpsons episodes. So, uh, you know, something I feel guilty now. I just realized we talked just very briefly about the fact of David, you are a talented improviser. You're a uh, sketch comedy writer and performer. I think you're dabbling in stand-up comedy now. Uh, tell us a little bit about that real quick. Plug some of your cool stuff that you're in and, uh, you know, 
any other social media or anything like that that you want to you want to plug for yourself go ahead and do that real quick oh uh, well, that's very nice of you to say uh, about my work I, i've done improv for a long time i love it i've done sketch for a couple of years now i took a stand-up class uh, I, I guess the main thing when it comes to plugging is wherever people are listening to this, uh, check out the work that local comedians are doing. Like, it's easy to go that. and see, like, a national touring show uh, or a stand-up that works different clubs along the nation, but uh, go see, like, local acts, because those people are working really hard, and they do good work, so you should support it. And on that note, um, for people that don't have, like, a comedy market near them, uh one like group of people that I feel like does really funny stuff <laughs> consistently uh, is uh, some friends of mine, Sally, Emily and Bonnie. They do a, um, it's usually through like their own Instagram pages. It's not like a, a sketch group page that you can follow, uh, but I don't know. Follow at daddy diapers. All, Instagram. All yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, just really funny, like quick little videos. Um, Will you say that wherever, name again? It kind of got uh, blurred out there. Yeah, it's at Daddy Diapers uh, is <laughs> Sally's Instagram. Um, so double and, D's. Yeah, 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 for sure. And uh, they do videos like every freaking day. Like it's their output is amazing. But wherever people are at, support your local comedians. I love that, man. That's great. Uh, everything there. Sally, Emily, Bonnie, all those girls, uh, they're, they're hilarious. And uh, some of my favorite people to, to hang and talk with at Dallas Comedy House. They're very, very funny people. Uh, you're another one of those people at Dallas Comedy House, which is a great place if you're in this area. And I, I just love what you said about local comedy in general, man. Wherever you are, go find a local spot and you'll probably have a really, really great time there, I have to imagine. Uh, but that's going to do it for this week's Best Darn Diddly Review Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate each and every time you download and view and share and all of that good stuff. It means so much that you join us on this journey through The Simpsons, The Golden Age, and beyond. You can, of course, follow our show at Best Darn Diddly. That's D-I-D-D-L-Y. You can follow Richie at the Wiz underscore Kid23, and I'm at Mr. Most Days Off pretty much everywhere online. Make sure you come back and see us next week. Richie and I will be back to review Bart the Fink. More like Bart the Dink. Bart sucks. Oh, <laughs> Bert. Boo, Bart. Well, make sure you guys come back and listen to these laboratory linksmen. <laughs> <laughs> and until next time, be cromulent to each other. Hey, this is The Toe, host of the Gravity Beard Podcast, a variety show with interviews and discussions on a wide range of topics. Our guests have included a viral YouTube star, a former child actor. We've even had a guy on who may have solved the D.B. Cooper case. It's a delicious box of audio chocolate. You never know what you'll get. Find it on Podbean, iTunes, and other places you listen to podcasts. It's the Gravity Beard Podcast. It's what your ears will want to be listening to.